Welcome to Monday Morning Coffee with Inside the Firm. Each week, our hosts will be interviewing local, regional, and national business leaders to give you an inside peek into how they lead their business to success in the ever-competitive business climate. Welcome to Monday Morning Coffee with Inside the Firm. Today, I have a very special guest with a beautiful name. Biate Chalette is the growth architect and founder of The Women's Code, Yate is known as a straight shooter and her ability to inspire and empower and overcome adversity. Her super skill is working with unique personalities and big thinkers in building executable systems. She is a first-generation immigrant who found herself $135,000 in debt as a single parent. She then bootstrapped her passion for photography into a global business that licensed content into 79 countries. She exited a multi-million dollar deal when she sold the company to Bill Gates. She is the podcast host of the Business Growth Architect Show and listed among the top 100 global thought leaders by People Hum and one of 50 must follow women entrepreneurs by HuffPost. Biate, welcome to the show. I'm so excited to be here. And just so everybody knows, the business, the photography business that I sold was specialized in architecture, interior, and celebrity homes. Beautiful, right? You're speaking our language then. Perfect. <laughs> well, before we get into what you do now, <clears throat> um, and uh, you know, even the past stuff about how you grew that company and sold it to Bill Gates of all all people, I'm always curious to understand the entrepreneur, your entrepreneurial story. What drives you as an entrepreneur? Like, where does that come from? Are you from a family of entrepreneurs? Are you the first? Where, where does all that come from? I'm really the first entrepreneur in the family, and. Uh, the idea about entrepreneurship is I seem to really like to build things and it's easy for me. So my original degree is photography. I come from the photography world. But I found out very quickly that my super skill was in understanding creative vision, visionaries, colorful, crazy people. I always, I always say um, I work with a lot of nonconforming, colorful characters. And I found that people with crazy, wonderful ideas have a really hard time landing planes. And then because they just, they would just love to go and circle at 30,000 feet and look at the terrain and it's so pretty up here. And then they don't pay any attention. They run out of gas and the plane crashes and it's over. And then I realized that I could combine two of my passions, which is to understand the creative and then to build business around these ideas. And that's what lights me up. And we are I, we are an impact-driven company because of that. Because when I look at how somebody takes this idea, you know, I was working uh, in talking to a photographer by the name of Russell Bayer, who's been a headshot photographer for uh, Hollywood hopefuls for a very, very long time. And we've been talking about what to do with it. And he just had a gallery exhibit here in Los Angeles where he showed Hollywood hopefuls. And this is Ben Affleck. I mean, when he was in the makings of Goodwill Hunting and uh, Eva Longoria, when she was the sexy hot thing before anything really has landed. And then to help somebody like that, to put something together and then see all the people there and the excitement, that makes me extremely extremely happy or when we when we when i worked with the photographers from architectural and interior photographers this was before we had uh digital photographs and they had these great images and everything was on four by five uh, plates and they didn't know what to do with it but i realized very quickly what the opportunity was and then i take somebody like a tim street porter who is literally the single most famous photographer in the architectural and interior uh, world. And I was able to create so much money for him that he could buy a house, a second house. And, you know, and then when his wife and him say to me, well, it's because of you that we can't spend so much time in Connecticut because without that, we would have never been able to do it. That's what lights me up. That's where I can see I make my impact. Yeah, you're making a difference. You're, bu you're building a company. You're building. I, I, I am with you on that one. I, I am literally also a builder. But that's what it feels like when you're making new companies. Like it is so exciting to build them from scratch is it's like the, you know, there's a, I've had there's a top five of like hard things to do in life, right? Like, like raise children, build a company, um, get a divorce, you know, stuff like that. But like 
it's that's really I'm I am one to one with you there. And then the making the impact people. Thank you for answering that. Um, what is a you label yourself as a growth architect? What does a growth architect do? Yeah, and the growth architect is derived from my work with architects and designers and photographers because when mm -hmm. you are building something, you have to make some fundamental decisions. It's like where are we building? What are we building? Who are we building it for? What do I want it to look like? Who needs to be part of this? And what would make me really happy? And in growth architecture, it's the same thing. I have the blueprint, but within the blueprint, you're completely free to design whatever you want to do. But the very much like how we build a house or how we work in construction, you have to you know, dig it out. You have to build the foundation. You have to pour the foundation. You have to get the steel in. You have to, you know, I mean, you cannot change steps when you're building a house. I mean, you could, but that would be really bad. Yep. So it's very much like in growth architecture, it's the same way. You certainly can uh, buy your, you know, your four people bathtub before you bought the property. And you've got your permits approved for that kind of size of bathtub in the house. But it would not be advisable because you skipped a lot of steps before you went to the furnishings of the house. And that's what we do. We help people with growth architecture and the five star success blueprint to understand what the steps are and then be able to follow them in order. Yeah, beautiful. Uh, I can't help, I have to ask the question about Bill Gates. So you sold, the, you sold your business to Bill Gates in a recession. How did you do that? Yeah, so when I built this business, the you know, and it was, as I said, specialized in architecture and interior photography. And what happened is I had this idea that I was going after the A-listers. So for anybody listening, it is the same amount of work to go after the A people versus the B or the C people. Just go after the A people, the B and C people come right with it. <clears throat> so when people say, well, no, try it out with other, no, 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 no. That is a waste of time. Just go to the top first. Once you have that, then you are, you have a unique market opportunity because these people also work with the best people. And what we had found out, and I, I didn't set out for that, is that somebody like Tim Street Porter photographed Seal's house in Mexico because he was best friends with the architect. And so suddenly I get a home story with Seal's house in Mexico out of embargo because it's just published in a magazine because Tim is one of the most published photographers in the genre. And he says, well, do you know what to do with it? Well, I was a photo editor at Elle magazine in Germany. I used to buy these stories. Well, of course I know how to sell these. So I built up an international syndication network and found out that there's a huge market for these celebrity homes. And then I got more and more of these home stories that all came from, you know, Alberto Gilli, from Peter Estes and Michelle Arno, I mean, the best photographers in the world. And it's Julian Moore, Francis Ford Coppola, Terry Hatcher, Simon Baker, and the stories just kept on coming. And I kept selling them and I became the world leader in this category. And as it so happened, Bill Gates had a privately owned company called Corbis. And he had bought a celebrity business that couldn't grow because it's a high touch business, which was a complete mistake on their part. Mm. So they were trying to systematize, automate a, a business that cannot, because it's, an, it's a high touch business. Anything with celebrities, high touch. And they couldn't grow it. And so I literally was the only person in the entire market out mm. there that had something that they could buy to grow that part of their business. And that's how they found me. And I had become the world leader in the category. They wanted to know how I did it. And I told them no. And because business was slowing down, they needed to do something. And so they bought. Me. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. I'm glad you touched about the, talked about the high touch aspect of it because you're, you're hundred percent right. And if for people who don't know what that means is it, it, if you're a CEO of a business, does it require your like almost a one-to-one -one touch of, you know, whatever you're doing, it's a product or, or people or anything like that. And if you don't have the ability to delegate that out and become a low touch, then it can't, it can't grow because you can't, 
replace yourself. You can't repeat. Then everybody else can't replace themselves either and start to multiply. Do, do I have that about right, BFA? Yes. So the idea is, and this is really part of a business model. When you go after A-listers and my, my fiance, he is in solar renewable energy batteries. And we live in the Pacific Palisades here in Los Angeles, which is where a lot of very, very wealthy people live. A lot of celebrities, a lot of people that do movies and directors and actors. And so when he goes to these places that are five, 10, $20 million homes, that is a high touch business, but that's how he's positioned himself. So your business model has to follow what the market is that you're serving and you know so there's three things you have to pay attention to it's one is service one is price and the third one for some reason escapes me right now i'm having a brain freeze but i'll i'll, I'll get i'll get right to that you can equality the third one's quality so you can only pick two out of three a lot of times people think I'm going to do it at a great price. I'm having great service. I'm doing, I'm, I'm going to give my clients great quality. You cannot do that. When you go to Nordstrom, you're not getting the price. You're getting the quality and you're getting the service. When you go to Walmart, you get the price, but you're certainly not getting uh, the quality. And so you are looking at how do you position yourself in that market? Now, when you are in the top market, it is almost always high touch because somebody who has a $20 million home who has a very expensive tile roof, who wants to add solar and battery has very different aesthetics and requirements than somebody who lives in a townhouse or has a smaller house, you know, in West LA and just wants to primarily save electricity cost. So somebody with a high touch attitude will pay more because they need to preserve their $20 million home and the aesthetics. And they want to tell other people that they got the best of the best. Whereas somebody in, you know, in West LA, maybe will say, Oh man, I got such a good deal on the solar. You got to check out this guy. So that's a positioning question. And the higher up you go, the more high touch typically you will. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> Uh, everybody who starts to try to break into a market, they try to, they have to just by the way it works is establish some kind of hierarchy, AKA an authority so that potential customers that are coming to them, trust them as a trusted advisor, because they are an authority figure in, in the, in the way by proving themselves or, or, or something like that. So what do you, what do you recommend as the best and fastest way to grow that authority? If, if I'm sitting back here, one of my audience members is, is considering starting a business in a, in a new market. Yeah. So the first thing I would say is what's the definition of authority? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people think influencing and celebrities is authority. It is not. So you have to make a fundamental decision. Gary V contrary to public opinion is not an influencer and Gary V is not an authority. Gary V is a celebrity. His whole business model is set up on Gary Vee himself. He is the brand. So I, you know, and I do business models for a living side note here. I still don't know what his business model is. I think his business model is what Gary Vee vodka, very Gary Vee steaks, Gary Vee, Gary Vee crypto, Gary Vee cars, Gary Vee everything. That's his thing. And he's throwing an obscene amount of money at it and it's mm -hmm. working. So when you're building your authority, I want to say 99% of your listeners lands are going to be in the actual authority, meaning an industry expert, a subject matter expert on something that you do. So to become the authority, you have to get this value proposition. We call this the unapologetic value proposition, the UVP. So clearly defined that people know what it is about you that is different, what are you the authority in, that has to be actually designed on paper in a branding exercise. It has to be communicated clearly. So I am not a business consultant, I'm a mm -hmm. growth architect. Yep. Why am I a growth architect? Because it says, it immediately has built in the second question. 
what does a growth architect do? Now we're talking. If I say business consultant, people go, I don't need a business consultant. The conversation is over. So that's a unique value proposition. That is an authority. It's like, well, we architect and we grow businesses. Okay, well, that makes sense. Well, tell me a little bit more about that. So if you want to be the authority in something, you're going to have to decide what you are the authority in, what the transformational journey is that you offer within that capacity as the authority, and then you have to position it to the market, and then everything you do has to has to tie into that. Yeah. It's, despite the corporate media uh, running cover, uh, that's what I would like to think they're doing right now. And the idea that we are not in a recession, I am a firm believer we are in a recession. If any, if you have any semblance of basic economics, you understand we are in a recession. Uh, I'm on the hiring side of things as a CEO of several companies, and I get I've gotten way more resumes and people asking for internships and jobs than I have previous to this year. So uh, if we agree that we are in a recession, I think that advice you would give about this question would be timely for our listeners. What should business owners do or not do during a recession? So I answer this with a very simple question. If all your competitors are going to stop advertising, what do you think you should do? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I was hoping that would be exactly your answer because that's my answer too is do not the first thing you should not do is think I'm going to cut marketing. Absolutely not. You have to keep the marketing because you have to keep the grease going in the, in that category. How many, do you have a number on like just by any chance or, or even a guess of how many business owners, like once they know that they're in a recession percentage wise, you know, is there, is there a number we can play to it? We're like, Oh yeah. Oh, over half I of businesses have, stop. Oh my God, Lance. I want to say this gotta be at least 80 to 90% because this whole thing, Let's wait and see. So let's just let's just pause here for a second. Wait and see. If I go in the fall and the, if I go in the spring and take a walk, so I'm going to go and see the tree. The tree goes, you know what? It's uncertain times. I'm just going to take 100 leaves and then we'll see how it goes. I'm, I'm just going to, you know, if people stop and they look at the 100 leaves and say, good job, tree. I like those leaves. Then I'm going to slowly roll out over the next couple of months, the next, you know, and I do a hundred at a time. Let's just be on the safe side. I don't want to spend too many resources on this. Said no tree ever. Uh, any animal goes, you know what? I'm not hungry right now. I think I should just hang out here a little bit, wait and see, you know, assess the situation. And then when I get hungry, then let me think about what my best next step should be. No animal said ever because every animal knows that they're going to be instinctively that they're going to be needing something to eat. So other than a human, this attitude just doesn't even exist in nature. If it doesn't exist in nature, it's probably a really bad idea uh -huh. because that means that your story is now running the narrative, which is contradictory to every universal law that there exists. You either grow or die. In nature, there is no such thing as status quo. It just doesn't exist. It's true. Yeah. So, Let's move to your book. Uh, so your, your book, Happy Woman, Happy World, you describe a concept called ego rhythm. Is this only for women? And what exactly is it? I actually... I, I primarily did it for women because when I sold my business and I was a single mom and then I took a job at Corbis and I realized what happens in the corporations and how, how this business code really works. I was like shocked. And then I saw how women are just driving themselves crazy by being running after perfection 24 seven. And for anybody who's ever met a woman or knows a woman, you know, that women are, you know, they always try to lose the weight. They always hard on themselves because they're not good enough mothers. They're not good enough cooks. They're not fit enough. Their butt's too big. Their cellulite too much. They got wrinkles. They're not successful enough. They didn't buy the car. And so I looked at this and I said, what women are trying to do is they're trying to have every aspect of their life be a perfect 10. Because what we do as women, we look at our friends, and I know men, men do it too. So to answer your question, it's a concept that works for men, of course. So we look at our friends and we say, man, Susie's got the smoking hot body, that's whatever. Then I look at Marla and I go, Marla, man, I mean, she can decorate her. 
place and it's always so pretty. I, I want to I want to be like Marla when it comes to my house. Mm-hmm. And I look at my friend uh, Jill and Jill is an amazing cook. Organic meals every day. The kids are, I mean, best meals. Now I want to be like Jill. And so my suddenly my image of myself is that I have to be the combination out of the best thing of all my friends combined mm. in one person. I mean, if I say it like that, everybody goes like, that's not possible. That's You're right. So that's what I call the superhuman paradox. So I looked at this and I said, okay, everybody just take a deep breath. Life goes in rhythms. So what was once important is sometimes not important at other times. So when a mother has a baby, the first three years of her life, she loses her identity. She's in her mother rhythm. And that's just the way it is. She's in a mother ego rhythm. If she tries to have a career, smoking hot body, be the best housewife, and, 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 and she's going to drive herself and everybody crazy. So the concept of ego rhythm says there's nine ego rhythms. Mm. And the more you try to do it once, the more you drive yourself nuts. And the clearer you are about what the main focus is at this point in your life, what is the main ego rhythm you're in? And you lean into that as the priority, as the main focus, the easier it will be to let everything else unfold as it must, because that rhythm is going to change. Yeah. Yeah. You talk about failing your way to success. What do you mean by that? Um, I Failing your way to success is when you don't update your GPS in your car and you know you should have, but you didn't. And then one day the shortcut under the freeway that you usually take is blocked because they're building the thing that they've been meaning to build. So you're going to stop. You're going to get out of your car. You're going to throw yourself on the ground. You throw a temper tantrum. You go like, I'm the worst driver in the world. That's it. I'm giving up driving. I will never drive again. Mm-hmm. And insurance is too, and, and cars, and I hate the car industry. It says nobody ever. You just go, should have updated my GPS. Wherever you wanted to go, you know the destination is still there. You wave at the gentleman in the hard hat and the neon stripe on his on his on his uh, green yellow outfit, and you just find another way. And we need to learn to look at failure the same way that we just been told by somebody with a nice stop sign, this is not the way. And that's failing your way to success because you're eliminating dead ends. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I always the way I've been thinking about it lately is uh, I, I appreciate when there's a negative because I know a positive is coming and it's going to balance it out. That's just the way physics works, the way the world works. Like you can't just have a one sided thing to it. And I actually get a little nervous when it's just all positive. It's like, oh, where's the negative coming? Um, so you you don't learn if you, you don't have the setbacks. You don't have you can't learn the lessons. It's very important. It's uh, actually a law. It's a law of polarity. You would only know that white exists because black does. The law of polarity. There you go. It, it took me almost 550 episodes to get that pulled that out of a guess. That was perfect. Thank you. I'm going to, I'm going to use that now. I'm going to just, that's it. I love that. Uh, no way. We're running up on the half hour. You've been such a fantastic guest. Um, I have two questions that I ask everybody at the end of the show. And that is the first one is knowing what you know now. And if you could go back in time to when you first started your business, what is one piece of advice you give your former self? Oh my God, I, I probably would say exactly that. Don't take failure personal and huh. and trust the path because in the end, it it does somehow work out. I mean, when I was in these 13 years of adversity and nothing came together and I finally surrendered and then my ship came in and it was a ship with Bill Gates on it and millions of dollars, then of course I would have enjoyed these 13 years of hardship more, but I didn't know that. So the journey is indeed the reward no matter how at what a shitty time this this sentence may come for you. Mm -hmm. It is the truth. The journey is the reward. So beautiful. Biete, if where, if people want to get in touch with you, your company work with you, where can they find and follow you? Yeah. So the simplest way is go and fill out an uncovery session and uh, make sure you mention the show inside the firm, because then we give you a priority treatment and we'll give you a 15 minute uncovery session strategize about your business, figure out what maybe a very, very best next step is. While we edit, do us a favor, wherever you pick up this show, go there now and give Lance a five-star review and make a comment. And the comment is so critical because it tells the algorithm that you like this show and that you engage with this show. And that puts it up further so that Lance can reach more people with the show. Thank you so much. We really appreciate your time today and wish you uh, nothing but success, especially, especially in the new year. Thank you so much.